Hello, Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Armando F. Sanchez. Thank you for being on our program today. It's just a very special show for me. It's very, it feels very energetic to have such wonderful guests on our today's show, especially, and I want to call him Dr. Doctor, uh, Dr. Carl Widerquist. Um, he is a professor in the Georgetown, but he's on the campus in Qatar in the Mideast. And we have him today from the United States. He's had a few days here in the area. He's in North Carolina, I believe, enjoying some uh, peace and quiet. And the idea is to look at the idea of basic income. And uh, I called him Dr. Doctor because he has two PhDs. So that's pretty impressive. And uh, from the background I did is he has written 850 articles, has a series of books out there. It just goes on and on and on. But I find that there's a passion in him when I've talked to him about basic income. And we'd like to learn about his background and how he got involved with the concept of basic income. And he has a very special view on that. So we're going to talk to him for the next 15, 20 minutes and get a background into that area. And then we have some panelists that will join us as part of the show. Dr. Wider, Chris, thank you very much for being on the program today. Uh, uh, my pleasure. Tell us, you know, before we get into the idea of basic income, give us a little bit of your background. I mean, how, how did you manage your time to be able to write so much and, and, and dedicate your teaching and then still be able to uh, give us this uh, sense of importance on basic income? Well, um, I... Uh, I, I, well, I should correct uh, 850 articles. Um, to, to get to 850, I think you have to count everything I've ever written for uh, basic income news as a separate article. Okay. Uh, and uh, some of those are just a couple of lines or, or even uh, cutting and pasting somebody's abstract. So uh, my, my actual publications is, is much lower than that. The, um, the uh, the, in, in, my, in an academia, people are concerned about your peer-reviewed papers, and I only have two or three dozen peer-reviewed papers and some books. Uh, so it's, 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 it's not nearly as big as it sounds from that number. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I, uh, how I got to do, to do it, well, you got to remember, I think, how uh, unfair our society is, and uh, uh, that some of those, uh, some of that unfairness has come to my benefit. I'm somebody that uh, doesn't have children, um, and I was able to land a pretty good scholarship, uh, pretty good scholarships, both at Oxford when I did my PhD there, and at the City University of New York when I did my PhD there. Actually, it was the reverse order. Uh, City University of New York first for economics, and I. Uh, I kind of realized after getting my economics PhD that I was that I was in the wrong field. Is that what I was really concerned about were the normative issues behind economic policy, and some economists do write on that. Uh, Marchesen, Milton Friedman, and so forth will write on those issues, but you can't really make your career on them. And the kind of things that they want you to make your career on as an economist were not the things that I mostly wanted to write about. I so, said, well, how do I write about how do I write about uh, political justice, economic justice, full time? And I started thinking, well, I could go back to graduate school and get another PhD. Um, and that sounded pretty good to me, but then, oh, that's crazy. So I had to think, I, I put that out of my mind for about three years. Um, like this is too, but after three years when I couldn't stop thinking about it, I was like, well, okay, I'm going to do this. I only applied, that time I only applied to one school. I applied to Oxford because I, I, um, I perceive it as the best in my field. And I was like, well, if I don't get into Oxford, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and I got into Oxford with a decent scholarship and actually some loans from the U.S. government that I was able to live for four years doing nothing but working on my scholarship. I, I didn't really have to teach or, or hold down a job. I got four years to just work on scholarship. And then after that, the first job I got was a fellowship. And I worked on my scholarship then. And since then, I've managed to get low teaching load jobs. And I have 
I have no children. So I don't have a whole lot of other demands on my time the way other people do. Just some of the unfairness you'll see is compare me with my wife, who is an excellent scholar in Spanish literature, and she has to teach twice as much as I do. I teach two classes a semester, she teaches four. I work half as much on teaching as she does, which gives me twice as much time to work on my research. And because I'm willing to do this in Qatar, I get paid three times as much as she does. Wow. Um, and it's not because it's not because I'm smarter or better. It's because I have lucked into these positions, and my life was flexible enough where I could go work for I could go work for the Emir of Qatar. And the reason I get paid so much money to work for the Emir of Qatar is not because my work there is more valuable than teaching the people that my wife teaches at Xavier, Louisiana, a historically black university. It is because the people in uh, the people running Qatar have so much money because there happens to be so much oil under the ground uh, and gas off the coast there. So it's really just uh, uh, all these things that are that are unfair that have given me the time to really put into my work. And then when you put the time into it, you get better at it. So people are going to come up, they're going to say he's really good. Well, actually, I'm really good because my privilege and my luck has allowed me to uh, has allowed me to take the time to get really good. You know, you meant, you talked about the idea of looking at economic justice. At what moment? Did you sort of get this inspiration that I have to commit to the idea of basic income and then share with us your perspective of what it is? Well, um, I, uh, I became interested, it's hard to say when I was interested in economic justice because that came at such a very young age. Um, I, uh, I was born in 1965, the year the civil rights legislation was passed in the United States. And growing up in an integrated town in Michigan, uh, I had the foolish notion that uh, this racism was the thing that was over um, and that we had to look at our next problems and that I thought that our next problem, the next biggest thing we had in this country was how horribly we treat the poor. It was also because I was raised by Christians. Both of my mother and father are very devout liberal Christians who believe what's really important in Christianity is the way it commands you to help those who need help. Um, so I was concerned with social justice and that we need something that works and that our system at the time was pretty big but it wasn't working that well. And I, this is I guess maybe a little embarrassing, but in 1980 when I was just, just before my 15th birthday, I saw Milton Friedman's television show, Free to Choose, where he did an entire episode, an entire one-hour episode, dedicated on how to fix the, fix the welfare state, and he had a negative income tax as the system. And, and what? I began to see the negative income tax, or the guaranteed income, or basic income, as a big challenge not only to the right to, to redistribute more, but a big challenge to the left, because if you really care about the poor, stop telling them what to do. Stop telling them that you're better for them, that, that you know what better what's good for them, that, that you want to fix them. Stop trying to fix them and start trying to fix the system. You're not smarter than the poor. You're not better. Uh, you're, um, there are so many people who are good, hardworking people that have had a bad set of situations. We've got to stop judging them and create a system that's going to make sure that nobody is denied their basic needs. So I see this as a challenge to both left and right. And that was in 1980. I didn't start writing about it until uh, more than 15 years later. But uh, I was... I knew that I would come back to it. I was learning about economics, learning about social justice, and I knew someday that I would come back to it. Absolutely, and we're very happy that you did because I think it's a, like you say, it's it's not so much repairing individuals, but it's repairing a system that impacts the individuals. And I know mm -hmm. that you're making, you know, I, I've heard some of your presentations that you have also posted on YouTube, some of your articles that you've written, and that we're inviting our guests also. So, Whoever's watching this program, please uh, do a lot more research on it. It's really insightful. Um, this whole concept of social justice, 
where does this all fit with the context of basic income? Well, I think it's it's extremely important to look at the the basic rules of your society, and are they just? And and what uh, what rules do you have to have for them to be just? And and at a, at a really a philosopher is a basic level. This is why I'm really so glad that I went back to graduate school and got the second PhD. Uh, because this is what political philosophers do all the time, is trying to find out what is an overall strategy that is just in our society. And there's very different ideas. You've got a, a libertarian idea that defending property rights is pretty much all there is to social justice. And you've got uh, a more liberal idea that we should, we should imagine justice as being a contract that meets the basic needs of the, of the most disadvantaged person, but we also all contribute to this con this contract. But to me, what makes a just society is that we realize that, that there isn't a contract, is that there is no contract that every single reasonable person would sign up to, is that we're always forcing somebody to do something they don't want. The majority has to make rules. But the majority is going to make rules and force them on a bunch of different minorities who have reasonable complaints. And we're, we're, what we're doing effectively, what we have throughout history, is that it's, and oh, we're lucky, actually, you're lucky if it's a majority making the rule. Usually it's some, some minority uh, coalition of uh, powerful people who are making these rules. Uh, the best hope is it will be a majority. But still, the majority will be forcing rules on others. And what we've done through most of history is some powerful coalition makes the rules and they force everyone else to obey. And the people that bear the brunt of that are the people that have neither political power nor economic power. They have no property and they have no political power. And we've been forcing everything down on them and saying, you don't get anything unless you either work for us or you meet whatever conditions we put on redistribution, which is usually proving that you can't work uh, or proving that you can't find work and all these things we want them to prove. Well, but we're getting our way. All of those of us who have political power, who have economic power, have lots of property rights, we're the people who are getting our way. We're taking the resources of the earth, the land and the water that we have available and using them for what we want and then we're saying to the poor, you don't get any of this unless you serve our needs. And it shouldn't be that way. It should be if we're taking all the resources, we should be paying back to those who have nothing. And that's the way I envision basic income, is the, is, is the, is the fact that other people have more resources than you do. Nobody created resources. Nobody invented resources. If, if people are going to take the resources you need to survive, they need to pay for those. And that payment needs to go to everybody else for all the, um, to, and it must be at a level that it's enough for them to survive on because that's what resources, resources do for you is they keep you alive. And so I envision everyone paying for the resources that they have and everyone receiving back for the resources that other people have. And that's how I see basic income. Is that It is compensating you for the fact that there are so many resources out there that nobody created that other people say they own and that the law says that other people own. As you mentioned, uh, the, the uh, rate of growth of the population, uh, the way that resources are distributed has shifted it's become concentrated on a small elite group and we're talking worldwide and what you're suggesting is look we need to look at this and we need to look at the persons that don't have anything that are born into a world where they can't possibly gain any of the resources because they're already taken is this basically what I'm getting yes yes very much very good summary well, you know, we also have the honor of having three individuals who are also part of the idea of basic income trying to share uh, on their own time as well the importance of understanding basic income. And I'd like to bring them into the show as well and also introduce them and have them uh, ask you some questions. I'm sure that they have uh, their contributions. Uh, I've had the pleasure of having all three of them in prior shows as well. And uh, let me bring them in one at a time. Uh, first of all is uh, Dr. Andre Coelho. He is right now in Portugal, so we're keeping him awake. Uh, stay, hang in there, hang in there, uh, Andre. And um, he's an engineer in background, 
We have Katie McFarland. She is also uh, in the neighborhood here. And then we have Jenna Van uh, Drainen. I'm always trying to get the names right. I forgive me if I mispronounce. And uh, they're also coming in from uh, different parts of the United States as well. So let me first of all um, give each person an in a moment to introduce themselves and we'll start with Andre. Hello everyone and uh, thanks Armando again for this marvelous opportunity. Uh, I'm Andre Coelho uh, with the engineering background. I got interested in basic income Actually, it was from uh, Carl's invitation. He didn't know I would reply, but uh, I did uh, a Facebook a Facebook announcement for for basic income news writers, and I uh, I thought it was interesting and applied. And two years later, here I am, kind wow. of interviewing Carl. Uh, <laughs> I agree with everything he said, but uh, I I think. I guess I take a different approach. Uh, I see I see social se social security nowadays is a very unfair, monumental, bureaucratic machine that really doesn't work, at least in Portugal, and and also uh, the economic downturn for most of people here in Portugal with with all this well all this economic crisis uh, doesn't give enough freedom for people to to pursue their goals to pursue their dreams in life. They, they always have to work more, to spend more time at their desks, or, or searching for work because jobs are, are, are disappearing, so uh, they, they must be running all the time, and that's something we don't need. We don't need this stress, we don't need this kind of disease, and so basic income would, would for sure uh, make things better. Well, thank you very much. Next we have uh, Kate McFarland. She's a PhD. She's also an editor with the Basic Income News, and she's in Ohio. And we'll welcome her on the show as well. Kate, hello. Hi. Thanks, Armando. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, like Andre, I got into, I got involved with Basic Income News by responding to a Facebook call for volunteers. In my case, it was just last winter, I believe. But I've been quite active since then. Um, my background, I have a PhD in philosophy, actually philosophy of language was my concentration, so not much to do with political philosophy or social justice, justice issues at all. Um, uh, I've been interested in basic income for a while, in part due to having a lifestyle similar to what Carol described, like having a lot of good academic scholarships and fellowships, and just thinking about how you know, this is a life that I would like to maintain permanently and that I think that everyone should be entitled to. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And our third guest and panelist today is Jenna Van Drainen, and she is in uh, Los Angeles. She's working on her PhD at UCLA. Sorry, USC friends of mine. <laughs> That'll be a different issue. Uh, Jenna, tell us about your background. Yeah, so I'm originally from Canada, and I'm here in the U.S. doing a PhD. I was um, drawn to basic income because of my interest in health. So my research looks at mental health and particularly um, the way social circumstances affect health outcomes. And for me, um, basic income is a way to ensure that people have the resources that they need to make the choices that will help them to have good health outcomes and the way that we can ensure that for the population at large we have um, good health outcomes. So I first got involved in the Canada Network about five years ago and met Carl at a conference um, and was really enthusiastic about writing for BI News um, more globally. So uh, yeah, it's, it's similar to what um, Andre was saying. It's um, a privilege to now be on a panel five years later with him. <laughs> what a small world it is. It may be global, but it's still small. With that, I'd like to open it for the panelists to ask questions to Dr. Ryder first. And uh, who would like to go first? Ladies? <laughs> I can go. I can go. No go ahead. Uh, yeah, actually, Carl, I, some time ago, I, I think you wrote or said that uh, 
he wanted to stay away from the question of technological un unemployment. And I got a bit confused. Why? Why uh, is he wanting to stay away from talking about technological unemployment? So that's the question. Okay, well, there, there are, I would say, two reasons, or maybe three. One is it's just it's not, it's not my area of expertise. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I, um, another is that people portray it, uh, people portray um, technological unemployment as being something that's, that's going to happen in the future. That, okay, well, if you're... Um, is we less uh, well, we might have this technological unemployment. Uh, well, let's wait until wait, let's wait until this happens, and then maybe we'll have basic income. And then the third thing is it implies that 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 if this is the reason we have basic income, that we shouldn't have it right now, or that we shouldn't have had it 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, or a thousand years ago. I don't think technology is is the reason that we need basic income. We need basic income because some people are taking the resources that other people need to survive and saying you can't have them unless you do what I say. That's why we need basic income and we've had that situation in some parts of the world for 5,000 years. Um, and uh, so we need for technology to do that. Now, I have written, I have written on Actually, 15 years ago, I was writing about this issue. Um, a well, at least 10 years ago, anyway. It's been a while. Um, the, uh, I wrote about Keynes's prediction back in the late 1920s. Keynes predicted that uh, there was going to be enormous growth in uh, by the end of the century. Be enormous growth, and then this would make it possible for all of us to work only a few hours a week if we so choose. Um, and that never happened. Uh, that didn't happen. Um, well, the thing is, the growth happened. The growth that he predicted did happen. We have all this enormous economic growth, but very few of us have this opportunity to live without working, or to live and work just a few hours a week. And, and why has this happened? It's happened because the benefits of that growth have gone to the people who own the resources and the things we make out of those resources, the capital, to a large extent, and they've gone to some higher end workers where you have you have people at the low end who have to pay more and more for their rent in order to survive, and, and there are very few people, unless you make a very high wage, that could live on a few hours a week, and then you're not likely to find a job that will let you do it, is that we the problem is not technology. We've had techno technology has already made it possible for us to replace large amounts of labor. The problem is that we don't give people the choice. We don't give people the choice for taking advantage of that. And the fact that we don't give them those, the choice and that we accuse them of, if they want to make that choice, we accuse them of somehow being lazy, being lazy for not wanting to work for people who already have more privileges than they do and wanted to just work for themselves. That has nothing to do with laziness. That has to do with a refusal to be somebody else's servant, which everyone should have the right to do. Um, is that the fact that we don't allow this choice is what has is what is keeping people from living better lives, especially people at the low end of the income spectrum. And this will be true if we have more automation. It's true at our current level of automation. It was already true when Keynes was talking about this in the 1920s. Makes such a big deal out of automation. Okay. All right. Yeah. The, yeah. Starting to make a lot of perspectives come in line with uh, the future as well. So, excellent question. Uh, next, we have Kate. Kate, uh, would you like to present your question? Yeah. First of all, wow, that was an excellent answer, Carl. I um, really am down with everything you just said. So, one thing that I was wanted to ask you about oh, is related to some of the points that you made. Um, so there's another justification of basic income that's slightly different from your own that seems to be popular in contemporary discourse. I've been hearing about it a lot lately. And it's related to some of the things that you said about how we have had this mass accumulation of wealth recently is just not equally distributed. But a justification that I've been hearing a lot lately just runs about like this. The idea is that society's present wealth is really the product of the collective contributions of the members of previous generations. 
and that we're all owed a share of this just as part of our collective inheritance to which we're all entitled. But often I've heard this justification where it just stops there, and it seems like it's really a matter of happenstance that this part of the collective inheritance that we each entitled is enough to allow us to live on our own and refuse forced participation in a job. So I'm curious how you see this other justification as fitting in with your own view. Do you think it's compatible? With, um, yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think compatible, that's compatible with what I'm with saying. With what I'm saying. But 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 uh oh I'm getting an echo. But uh oh I'm getting an echo. <laughs> Um, Are you still coming see. in? Loud I will here? Let's see. Um, I will. Um, mute. I'm going to mute my. I'm going to mute my. I'm going to mute my. Uh, uh, my I'm headphones. Uh, my until, headphones. So, uh, until, uh, I'm talking, so okay, I won't hear the speed. So I won't hear the speed. So if so anybody interrupts me, I won't hear you. So if anybody interrupts me, I'll try to put this back up when I'm done talking. Okay. Now. Okay. Now. 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 There's. There's a common there's, perspective about from a bunch of people who take this idea of that they're of, of that they're uh, trying to distill this into into distill something this into, small into enough, something uh, small enough, enough, small enough to fit into the time that we have and but still make it clear for, general, clear for general audience. I know this question is coming from another philosopher. So she and I have more background. More background. There's a perspective that's sometime called left libertarian. Which is, the idea which is the idea that, that, that you should that own yourself, you should own yourself the, the way a right uh, libertarian would right say, libertarian but, but that no that one has no particular one has ownership, ownership rights, ownership rights to, to, no one has particular no one ownership, has particular ownership rights, rights to the resources of the earth, 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 earth or the things we make out of them, which would be the kind of thing that Kate is saying with collective inheritance. Collective, collective inheritance is made up of the resources that we're here to begin with and the thing that past generations made. Now, then a lot of people will say, well then, uh, there's this left libertarian idea that's been out there since the 1870s when a guy named Henry George uh, wrote up a pretty extensive argument about it, which is that what he said is that the only just tax is a tax on that inheritance. I'm not so strict to say that's the only just tax. But he's saying the only just tax is a strict tax on that inheritance. Um, and then so we should tax this and give it back to everybody else. And, and but the question is, well, is that tax going to be enough to give it back to everybody else? And is that an important question? Well, so Henry George's answer, and a large field of people since Henry George, right up through contemporary philosophers like uh, Michael Otsuka and well, Steiner, have uh, gone with an empirical argument to say that, yes, it is enough. If you look at all the rents earned income in the world today by looking at the, the banking sector and the things that the government gives away. If you're looking at all these things up, it's a whole lot of money. Um, and then you get you get another uh, way to take it is, is what Philippe Van Parijs says. Uh, Philippe Van Parijs is, is someone else from this uh, end of the spectrum and he's a very important basic income supporter. He says, well I'm not going to make any empirical argument about how much money you're going to get from taxing all the resources and the past inheritance. You should do that. But I'm not going to count on that being enough, a, a, a decent amount of money. But what he says is that a lot of your jobs embody rents. Is that the labor market is not perfect. It's never going to be perfect. It's not fair. It's never going to be fair, and that means that some people just get lucky. Like you take uh, uh, you take somebody who's uh, you take somebody who's very good looking and has a nice speaking voice, and they can be a newscaster. And you get somebody else who's not so good looking and has a scratchy voice, and they can't be a newscaster. And then once you get into being the job of being a newscaster, then you become famous. And then because you have this job, then you become the famous person who does this and you can go to any other network and get this money. And a lot of that comes just from the luck of the draw. So what he says is that you have, you have an advantageous market position that other people can't get, um, then, uh, then that is something we can tax as well. That is a rent even though it's not a rent on a resource. 
And what he argues, if you look at the tremendous unfairness in the labor market in the world, then this empirically will be enough money. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Andre. And uh, next we go to uh, Jenna Vendrainen. Uh, she's also here in Los Angeles, and her background is from health. So uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, um, okay. So, um, so my question is not about health, but about economics. I often get asked, um, if we have a universal basic, basic income, won't we just see inflation? And without an economics background, I don't feel comfortable answering that question. So I'm curious what the most compelling answer to that that you've heard, Carl, and how you usually deal with that question. Yes, I find that one of the easiest questions there is to answer, is that basic income is government spending. It is, it is like any other government spending. It's not a special kind of government spending. It has the same effect on inflation as any other government spending. Now, the United States spends more on the military than almost the whole rest of the, gov of the world combined. What is it, a half a trillion dollars a year? Or is it up to a trillion? I don't, I'm, I'm not keeping track of this. It's a lot of money. And what would happen if the U.S. government spent a trillion and then did not have money back? Well, that would cause inflation. And why is it defense spending doesn't cause rampant inflation? Well, that is because we tax that money back or we sell bonds um, and have debt to keep it from getting inflation. The similar with our other forms of spending, uh, with our highway spending and our spending on spending on education, we spend those inflation in tax that money or we borrow money income. If you have basic income, you have to have some taxes that are going to keep all those basic income dollars from pushing up prices. You tax that money back and you won't and you won't have inflation. So if you you have basic income, uh, you see some inflation, you, you, you realize, okay, we haven't taxed enough of this money we're putting out the economy back. It's, uh, it's really one of the easier problems with basic income. All right. So now we continue as we're coming close to the show. Uh, you know, just so much to think about, so much to deal with. It's just fa fabulous. I'm sort of trying to process myself all this information. Um, as we're coming to a closure to the show, uh, let's go back. Uh, we're going to start with Jenna, uh, closing remarks on her behalf, then Kate, then Andre, and then we'll close with Dr. Whiter Chris. Sure. Um, sure. Um, I think it's a really, I think it's a really basic income income movement. Um, um, personally, I'm seeing personally, a lot of. I don't have the echo again. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. So. Is that everybody muted? Everybody muted. Okay. Okay. Um. Um. Well, I'm excited. Well, I'm excited. What are happening in Canada? In Canada, projects coming out, and we have a lot of activity um, in the municipal governments and provincial and national governments as well. Lots of interest and activity. So. I think it's an exciting time to be in the basic income movement, and I encourage all of the viewers to uh, get involved and join your local networks because in Canada we've seen a lot of um, growth in the local networks and a lot of uh, political interest as a result. Thank you very much. And next we move on to uh, the whole idea with Kate. Well, and I definitely enjoy it. And I, um, I found his answer to my own questions as well as the others very useful, so thank you, Carl. Um, so what else? Um, it's also an exciting time here in my hometown of Columbus, Ohio for basic income. Just to put a plug out, I just started my own group. It's currently nine days old, but there happens to be a lot of excitement that I'm finding in my home city. Um, also, just one last comment about the exciting year for basic income. Of course, we have a lot of pilot studies on a basic income experiments coming up in the next year. It didn't come up in this um, webcast, but I also wanted to note on behalf of Carl Whitequist that he has some really good and useful work about basic income experiments. Maybe he can mention his closing statement, but I know one that I've read recently is called The Bottom of Line in a Basic Income Experiment. It's a paper that's up on his website, but it's, it's really useful if you want to think about some of the limitations of these experiments that are going to be going on. All right, thank you very much. And Dr. Whitaker, did we lose him? Is he still in the picture? 
Andre still has Andre still has this thing. Uh, we may have lost him. We may have lost I, him on the, in I, the transition right now. Andre we'll needs make, Andre need make. Okay, well, well, while we're waiting, I, while we're waiting. <laughs> no, the idea is that you know, I what I've learned today, and we can talk a little bit about that. Maybe we get it back. Is the idea that it's 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 a topic that goes beyond just simply. Uh, technology and unemployment. It's like it says, it's the use of the resources. The whole concept of how we distribute them amongst ourselves and giving everyone uh, the privilege of enjoying the wealth of the nations, if you will. So I, I'm beginning to, to take a whole different perspective that I can work with as well. So uh, let's see if we have uh, Dr. Widerquist back online, still trying to connect. Uh, thank you very uh, thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the income, income, income uh, content, uh, content, go to basicincome.org basic and, uh, and uh, look for the, uh, for the, uh, look for the opportunities for the volunteer. Just send an email, carl at whitequist.com. Excellent. Yeah, we did lose him somewhere, but I'm glad he came back into closing statements. With that, I want to thank everyone here on the panel today, Dr. Carl Widerquist, who has uh, given us his time to sort of lead us into the perspective of what we need to learn more of and basically it's the resources, social justice and the distribution of wealth amongst uh, all persons who share the planet so that we don't come into conflict with each other because as the population is growing, increasing, uh, we have to look at ourselves as I learned today, uh, you know there is no set formula, There is we don't inherit on the earth a set economic program we're developing it amongst ourselves. Uh, all of you are leaders and you're helping to put policy in place in your own backyards and as well that it grows on a global level as we're doing in today's show. So as I sign off right now, I'm Armando F. Sanchez. I've been your host. Please feel free to email me at lsacnational at hotmail.com. But again, I cannot thank enough Andre, Jenna, Kate for their support. Um, they reach out not only to their community but also to me. And please feel free to contact them through their website, bien.org. Uh, and again, we thank Dr. Wider Chris for being on the program today. I look forward to doing future shows, having more discussion. Feel free to email us our question. And with that, we're going to sign off. I'm going to thank everyone for being on the show. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dr. Wider Chris. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Armando. Thank you, Armando. Okay. Take care, guys. Thanks, Armando. Thanks, Armando. Goodbye. Bye. Okay.